Got and, on. And, and whenever you can, if you can Move. recap, oh, you know, okay. before moving on, oh, like, yeah. just because okay. well, I'm always looking for the sentences that with the most clarity explain to the okay. non-expert yeah, okay. where we are. So that so, we okay, well, I, I would recap. So what looked like a contradiction between the two traditions, namely, you either had to choose that what was important was eternity, in, as in Plato, or time, as in the Hebrews, turns out, and what leads to a contradiction, uh, Kierkegaard formulates as a contradiction, but, he, but for him it's also a phenomenon. Namely, he says, eternity is only possible in time. And then he gives an explanation of what human eternity is in terms of loving someone forever. Hold on, you're doing so well, and your microphone is rubbing up against your shirt. Here, see this? Because this is really good, the way you're... That, this is very clear now, this is rubbing on your shirt. Hold on. Why I got to be sensitive to all these things at once. I know, that's why, I mean, usually... The pros have one person thinking only about sound, one person right. thinking about image, and one person to think about the direction. Okay, I'm just going to start I one. Be, I'm doing three people. Yeah, I'll just start one sentence back. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so what sounds like a contradiction when Kierkegaard formulates it, that eternity is only possible in time, and which uh, there is a phenomenon in which that really happens, and that's this phenomena of loving somebody forever or dedicating your whole life to some particular uh, cause, or even you could dedicate it to some particular theory about the universe, like Bruno. The important thing is that you're ready to die for it, and it gives your whole life meaning, and it defines who you are. So then the other two also have their contradictions. So it looks like either you, the ethical is the universal, or the highest thing you can do is whatever God calls you to do, and then it looks like the ethical is trumped by the individual. And so Kierkegaard has the slogan, uh, the individual is higher than the universal. And that looks like something Plato would find absolutely crazy and the Hebrews wouldn't understand. What's the phenomena? Well, the phenomena is interesting. I mean, one half of it is easy to see. It's the individual commitment, like romantic love or Martin Luther King's vocation, which is higher than any universal principle uh, at all. Martin Luther King's a little complicated because he's got a universal principle about justice, too. But you could have some particular cause which was all your own and nobody else could do it. And uh, an artist can have that sort of uh, uh, kind of commitment, too. And so the question is then, what does it mean uh, so to say? I'm sorry, I keep, That's right. I keep swinging back to, towards you. See, this Maybe is just moving. going I can't see. It, and then every time you move, it rubs no. against your okay. shirt here. Let's see if we went the other way. That's the idea. Okay. Now it can't do that anymore. Okay. There we go. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Let's go back to the. Let me think a minute. So, uh, okay. So it looks like Kierkegaard's slogan, "The individual is higher than the universal," is that well, this, the, another version of the contradiction because I, the the universal is the ethical, and that's what makes what you do intelligible to you and everybody else because you do it on the basis of principles, which are either rational or. Uh, traditional. Uh, they have to finally be rational, I guess, in this picture so that they would be universal. But, and how could anything be higher than that? Remember for Plato, the universal is even, is even binding on God. God. God approves of things because they're good. They're not good because God approves of them. So how do you put these two together? Well, you could just say, do the thing that's your commitment. Do your thing and be ready to die for it, who cares about the ethical? In a way, that's exactly the, what Heidegger gets out of it, and uh, it's what Sartre certainly gets out of it, and most existentialists, but it isn't what Kierkegaard thinks. Kierkegaard thinks doing the universal is very important and a valuable, absolutely crucial insight of the Greeks. He's all for 
philosophy. And he, the way he understands it is, above your individual desires, your superstitions, your tradition, your quirky perspective on things, whatever, you've got to get rid of all that. He calls that lower immediacy in his jargon. But that means you've got to uh, what he calls mediate it, that is, see it for what it is as something that is just n of no value. It's just you, are happen you happen to have these beliefs and these uh, desires and so forth. And philosophy has taught people how, through criticism and reflection, to get over there, say, prejudices. And, and that's an important step because you wouldn't be able to tell your defining commitment from fanaticism and prejudice if you just sort of jumped into this and said, well, I'm going to give my life for such and such, or I'm going to love so and so all my life, you wouldn't know, well, let's say, infatuation from love. But you can tell infatuation is lower immediacy. And if you could get rational and detached enough, you can get over it. And then, if you can, after that, you get a kind of commitment, you can see that that commitment is different. And that's an unconditional commitment, that's love. So Kierkegaard has managed to make philosophy and uh, the Hebrew Christian revelation work together. Uh, only he's made a decision, so to speak, that, that the Christian revelation finally is the, is the highest level. But you can't get to this highest level without going through the Greek uh, critical, reflective, detached, objective level. And so, so, and, and, and Christian, in this sense, doesn't necessarily meet, mean religious in the way the everyday person understands religious. Right? Good. Whenever I say Hebrew Christian, of course, I don't mean you have to be a believer, in, Jew or Christian. That's why the troubadours were important. I and mean, you can take the Christian phenomenon and turn it into something secular like the knights and ladies, where the, the holiness and sacredness and life-definingness is all still preserved in the relation of the knight and the lady, but they don't have to be Christian anymore. And romantic love is the final flowering of that. So the third one, then, is the question of truth. Which is higher? the kind of truth that Galileo was following, where there was an objective truth and it was the way the universe was and everybody else, and, and, and people could discover it or not, it didn't matter, uh, it was the truth, or truths that you're willing to die for and, and uh, as a martyr uh, and who depend upon, their, their truth depends upon your commitment to them. Well, for Kierkegaard, and Kierkegaard's slogan there, the contradiction is for in the, in the, at the highest level, truth is subjectivity. And then, well, let's explain that. Well, it's not what he calls mere subjectivity, where that would be, again, passions, desires, superstitions, and prejudices. You've got to get rid of them. We've talked about how you do it through mediation and the universal. And then the highest kind of subjectivity is becoming an individual through a commitment and so that... Uh, Again, you can have the kind of scientific truth that Galileo had. There's nothing, nothing wrong with it. It's terrific, and Plato was right. Theory is important. But the highest kind of truth, he wants to say, is the kind of truth that you get when you're a committed individual. So, that's, so, so it, in the end, unconditional commitment to something else, something that is what he calls finite and temporal, a person, a cause, and so forth, salvages the best of both worlds. Instead of being caught in the kind of crossfire of these two worlds which annihilate each other, so you don't know whether to act as an individual or act universal, you don't know whether to be a scientist or to be a, 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 a Bruno-like uh, religious person, you don't know whether, what's the last one, uh, to live in time or to try to live in uh, detachment and, deter and do everything in the, under the aspect of eternity, you don't have to make the, that agonizing choice. There is a way in which the two traditions reinforce each other and this culture which is so divided can become a very, very, very strong culture if it can take in both aspects. So does it just 
does it does it take in both aspects only for certain individuals who are capable of doing it and the rest are lost is that well, okay yeah well and every individual this is a christian view but it's also a greek view every individual is capable of this both sides believe that interestingly enough that every individual for plato as long everybody had a rational soul even slaves if they learn greek <coughs> like Epictetus, who was a slave who learned Greek, can do philosophy, and anybody can learn Greek. The, uh, until they do, they're just barbarians. That was the uh, imitation of the sound that they seemed to make, going bar, 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 talking this other language, whether it was Persian or whatever. But they, they have rational souls, they learn Greek, they can do it. And for Christians, of course, and Jews, everybody can do it. It's a little. It's not so clear for Jews because they're, they're, that's God only made a covenant with these people. Any Jew can do it. Any Hebrew can do it. But then, when the Hebrew tradition got, when Jesus took it over, and 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 there was this big fight, I think, between uh, James and Paul or something. I forget who. That uh, it was about circumcision. Whether the, which was going to be. I mean, was it, was there going to be circumcision, <coughs> a requirement? for being able to do it? If so, it was going to be rather limited. Or was it going to be open to everybody? And Paul, I'm pretty sure it was Paul, came up with this idea of circumcision of the heart, which meant really that you can get rid of the circumcision and thereby it's available to everybody. And so then, so Judeo-Christian way of being became available to everybody. So now from both sides, everybody can do it. Uh, not, but it's very, very hard. Though everybody can do it in some, in some sense, that every, it's a capacity that every human being has. Very few people are strong enough to do it because you have to live in this kind of risky way in which, you can put it this way, your passion makes this other person your savior. But there's no objective ground for their being your savior. It's not, it's, this person is adorable only if in so far as you adore them so that uh, it's and there's nothing sort of ground for this commitment that and therefore it's risky to in it in a sort of in rational way it's a crazy thing to get into that's already tough but also it's a very risky thing to get into not only does it have no ground not only is uh, beatrice a savior only if you make her a savior and adorable only if you adore her but if you lose beatrice your whole life is meaningless so you've got to take this risk of grief and you can only do this if you have what kierkegaard calls faith which is a funny kind of way of being in the world that's sort of deeply optimistic, that you believe that for God all things are possible, Kierkegaard says, meaning that somehow, whatever happens, you will never lose your defining relation. And that could be heard in two ways. There's the wrong way, which is the Greek way, that is, even if the other person dies, you can remain true to them for the rest of your life. That's what happened with Dante and Beatrice. She died young, and he married and had children, but everything in his life was really around Beatrice. Uh, and Kierkegaard calls those people knights of resignation, because they're resigned not to get the temporal and daily fulfillment and meaning that comes with this kind of commitment, but only the universal, eternal significance, or never mind universal, never, they only want the significance of the relationship. And some people, before they even lose the other person, in order to be safe, convince themselves that it's only the meaning of the relation that counts, not whether the other person is actually around or not, or not whether the cause succeeds or not. And that's, then they're nights of resignation, they're in a kind of despair because they never can really get the full temporal and eternal together, the full individual and universal, the full, uh, what else is there? Uh, truth, objective and subjective truth together. So, so let me get back on the main track. So that's the wrong way to live as if all things are possible because it declares that one thing is impossible 
that you're guaranteed that you will have joy in this life, as Kierkegaard would put it, that you will always have a defining commitment. That means you may not always have the one you've got now. And you will get, Kierkegaard talks about, if Abraham sacrifices Isaac, he, he feels that he will always have, he will get a new Isaac to talk like Kierkegaard. Let's explain that. What's really paradoxical for Kierkegaard is, Kierkegaard doesn't understand this very well because he never managed to get over his broken engagement with Regina. But what, what, what's really paradoxical is grief. If you have a defining commitment and go through grief, that commitment becomes a part of you, that you interiorize that relation. You're always going to be, take Dante, the one who loved Beatrice and whose whole life was defined in terms of Beatrice. But you don't make Dante's move of then eternal devotion to Beatrice, whether she's around or not. You, you, take, you accept the fact that that person is not around anymore. You live in terms of having loved them and lost them, and that makes you open to a new defining commitment. So what the person who has faith has is that I'll always have a way of living in which the, I will have finite, temporal, eternal, <coughs> infinite uh, <coughs> put together in my life because I will always have an unconditional commitment and I will never betray an unconditional commitment but you can get a new unconditional commitment. That's what Kierkegaard thinks though he doesn't really know how to explain it since it didn't happen for him. Let's let's take a uh, two second break. Okay, you maybe yeah. Let's see. No, let's see if somebody's out there and maybe some water. Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. That's why we put that. That's right. That was close. What would happen if it fell on the floor? I don't know. <laughs>